where we left off in chapter 3 last week. If you can kind of rewind and remember, the Jews or the Jewish leaders, quite possibly, uh, had approached John the Baptist up in Ain and right off the Jordan River. And, and out of a dispute over what we believe was baptism, purification, baptism, over this dispute with his men, they, uh, they, they told him that many people were coming to Jesus for baptism, almost as to, to rub it in John's face. Hey, more people are going to Jesus. But he was unmoved. He was, he was unrattled. Actually, he, he was moved. He was moved to joy, we're told, and, and, and explained to them that this was a good thing, that, that Jesus and his exposure needed to increase and his, John the Baptist's exposure, needed to decrease. And the, the gospel writer, he continues from this news of Jesus' popularity in chapter 4, verse 1. But instead of Jesus monopolizing um, on the Jewish popularity and their, their recognition of him, he travels where no Jews dared because, because he's a God that bravely challenges the status quo. He goes where we wouldn't go. He speaks and loves people we wouldn't go to and speak to and love. And his love he offers to all, anyone who will receive it. It's a beautiful reality about our God. And we read in verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize uh, but his disciples, either he only baptized his disciples or his disciples did all the baptizing. Either one of the two, we go both ways, with that, uh, according to the original language. Uh, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So there is this, this interesting dance that Jesus does with making his identity known and, and then connecting with the world around him. Sometimes, as in his hometown of Nazareth, before the crowds at the temple and healing the multitudes, he is anything but reserved. But you also see him swerve from the masses from time to time almost intentionally avoiding them to make room for one-on-one for -on -one time. One-on-one -on -one time, as we'll see in this passage, and with his disciples in this small group interaction. And we'll, we'll observe this happening here in this, in this next text, right, as he travels up through Samaria. Uh, avoiding popularity altogether, we read in this passage that he left Judea. And he headed north to Galilee after his popularity uh, was really exploding. I mean, you and I would think, hey, let's go down there. The publicity's there. Uh, let's, 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 hey, the people are knowing who we are. They're buzzing about this baptism. They're ba the, about people shifting from John the Baptist. They're buzzing about. That's what we would do. But Jesus, he's, he's quite, works quite the contrary. Kind of leaves it. He's got a purpose and a plan. Now, I believe the Lord meets us uh, in, in this way as well. Like sometimes uh, he, he wants to meet us in worship gatherings uh, amongst many others, like in, in group settings, like these service settings and worship times and big Bible study times. And, and, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to re reveal his, his love to us, his power, his healing. But he also meets us in connect groups, one-on-one -on -one times. And, and I love this. I love this because I personally believe these times are the most impacting, the most, the most intimate and lasting concerning our relationship with him. But we see these powerful one-on-one -on -one meetings in this next passage. So Jesus, he leaves Judea, he heads to Galilee, but the route he takes is less than kosher. It was through a place called Samaria. And most of the times, Jews did everything they could to avoid uh, Samaria. Uh, you see, there was this centuries-old feud between the Jews and the Samaritans. And partly, uh, we're, we'll get into 
part of the reason for the dispute having to do with worship in just a little bit as Jesus dialogues with the Samaritan woman. But the Samaritans were part Jewish and part uh, Assyrian. When the kingdom of Israel was divided, the Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom, 10 tribes in the north. Only Judea in the south, the two tribes were left in the south called Judah. And they conquered the northern kingdom. They took a lot to exile. And then many of them, they intentionally bred themselves with, partly as a demoralizing thing and also to, to, to spread their, their race of people amongst the world. And so what you had in Samaria from the Assyrians and also other Canaanites who kind of were interbreeding with the people of uh, the northern tribes, you had kind of a mixed people. It was a mixed people. And, and the Jews uh, disliked them and treated them as less than a people. And the Samaritans didn't like the Jews for it either. And so there was this few back and forth. They just didn't like each other at all. And the quickest way from Judea to Galilee went through Samaria. And it could be traveled three days through there. The alternative route, which I think I have back here, the alternative route was to cross the Jordan, go up the eastern side uh, uh, of the river to avoid Samaria, and then cross uh, the Jordan in, uh, back into Galilee. This was the route that took half or twice as long, six, almost six days uh, to take this route. So Jesus decided to pass through Samaria in order to take the shortest route to Galilee, but not just that reason. I don't think it was just for convenience uh, as a motive. We we're told that he needed to go through. He had, he had a purpose and a plan to go through. He needed to, to go through. And next we see what this great need really was all about. In verse 5, we read that a certain man... Uh, oh, I'm in chapter 5, so don't do that. In verse 5, so he, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. There is a lot of Jewish history in this, this place, Sakar. It's where Abraham, or Abram first, before he's Abraham, Abram first stopped when he entered the promised land from the place called Ur. Genesis 12 also tells us that this is where the Lord renewed the covenant with him. And Abram built an altar. Later, Jacob purchased a piece of land here. He built an altar, dug this well, and they named it because of this and named it Jacob's Well where Jesus is at with this, with this woman encounter. It's where Jacob's daughter, Dinah, was raped. And the whole Dinah incident took place, which makes every man squirm when they read it. It's found in Genesis 34. I'm not going to tell you about it. You men got to go read it. Uh, make you squirm, though. And, and Genesis 34. And from our text referring to uh, Genesis 48, this land that was getting the plot of of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Land, land Jacob had conquered from the Amorites with a sword and bow. And, and later we're told uh, Joshua, Joshua 24, uh, this is where Joshua will, will make a covenant with Israel, renewing their commitment to God, the God of Israel, and proclaiming that famous passage that we all gravitate and grab hold on. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was here at this place. It's this historic place that Jesus finds himself. And interestingly enough, the God of the universe finds himself, also 100% man, wearied. Wearied from his journey after a long day walking. And we're told that a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, it is, it's unusual that this woman came at the sixth hour or noontime. 
This is the hottest time of the day. Normally, women, they would come to draw water in the morning and in the evening, the cooler parts of the day. It's also strange that she came alone. Women often traveled together in groups. It was for protection, but it was also their social time. They didn't have Twitter and Facebook and all the other things. They, they didn't, they, they, this was their social time. So they got to be with their friends and other ladies in the, in the community and, and go down and, and take care of their chores together. So it's strange that this woman's by herself in the middle of the day. And all of this suggests that this woman may have felt a sense of shame. She'd been ostracized. She was avoiding contact with other women. Maybe she was a social outcast. But you have to know the culture and, and practices of that time to see really how bizarre and strange this scenario is. You know, we travel to other places, and, and we experience other cultures. Sometimes it's shock, right? <laughs> First time I went to Haiti, um, was, uh, uh, I was with uh, Steve, Steve, uh, Steve Gardner. He's he, our, one of our elders who's um, mission in, in Haiti for 20-plus years. He's been there, and he knows it inside out. He's not really shocked by much that goes on in Haiti. And Deb as well. And they used to take the whole family two, three months at a time. So uh, the first time I went, we, we landed in Port-au-Prince, and then we were waiting. We had to, to get on another hopper flight to go on uh, MAF to, uh, to uh, Port-au-Pay and then out by tap-tap to Pescadawa. Well, at that first airport in Port-au-Prince, I remember uh, going to the bathroom, and I remember following Steve into the, into the bathroom, and as I walked in, there was a, a woman in there, right? There was a woman in there, and it wasn't a gender identity crisis thing. I mean, she knew she was a woman, and everyone else knew she was a woman, too. And she was in the bathroom, and, um, and, but it, which is one thing. That's one thing. But then when she was cleaning the urinal next to me and all in front of me, um, it, was, it, made, it made the whole thing very difficult, right? Just extremely difficult to, and, you know, she I'm just curious about us blancs, I guess. I don't know, but, but, uh, but so, and I remember I, I walked out of the bathroom and I was like, oh, well, that was just a bizarre situation. And Steve and all the guys are laughing out front, you know, like, ah, yeah, welcome to Haiti, you know. They're just not embarrassed like we are, or ashamed of things, they're, they're just off there. So uh, the cultural shock, cultural difference, you know, of, of, of from one place to another, and we're only a couple hours removed. Thousands of years ago, you know, when you, when you think about what takes place with Jesus and this woman at the well, woman and Samaritan, it just changes everything to understand the culture of, of, that, of that time. And here we're told that, that Jesus initiated the conversation and made this request to her, give me a drink. By, by tradition, a rabbi not just a man, but a rabbi would not speak with a woman in public, not even with his own wife, right? Definitely would not fly today, right? But, but, but he just would not do that. It was also very unusual for a Jewish person of that time to ask a favor or to accept a drink from a Samaritan's cup. And Jesus' Jesus' request genuinely surprised the woman. The disciples were also surprised, we're told, later on in verse 12, right? They were shocked about the whole situation. But let's, let's step back for a moment and think about this scenario. I want to draw your attention to something specific that God put on my heart. The, the God of the universe who created everything, who spoke all things into existence, who can feed thousands, we'll see in just a little bit in a couple chapters now, who will feed thousands from just a little bit of bread. But here, when he was hungry, he sent his disciples to go, get, to go get food. And when he was thirsty, he requested this, this woman at the well to give, him a, to give him a drink. Don't you love how our God delights to engage us? Regardless of who we are. Regardless of what we look like. Regardless of what we've done, as we'll see this woman's situation. Regardless of who we are, he engages us. What an amazing God. What a beautiful God. And then, let me take it a step farther. He also makes requests of us. You know, he can do everything. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our time. He doesn't need our, our talent, our treasure. He doesn't need our service. God really needs me. No, he doesn't. He needs none of us. We, we, if anything, get in the way of things, you know? Like when you're teaching your kids how to do something, right? It's easier just to go do it. But no, he, he, he wants us to because we get the benefit from it. 
Kids see that later on. <laughs> Sometimes it's grown kids like us. We see it later on too when God engages us, right? And when we respond and serve him, we find ourselves not only ministering to, but being ministered to by the most incredible, benevolent, and concerned Lord and Savior. What a treat to be made a request of for God to, to ask us to go, to, to, to ask us to serve him, to come, join him in his work, and to go and to be his light. It's such a, such a joy and a thrill. Uh, and, oh, if I could just get that in my mind and my heart and you as well, to know how special this is, right? But this request throws this woman off. <laughs> she asks, how is that? You, being a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman. Immediately, the, the woman was impressed by the friendliness of Jesus. And as I mentioned earlier, it was, it was unusual for a man to engage a woman in those times, but especially from a Jewish man. And John shares that Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's what he, that's what he mentions in this passage. Jesus, he powerfully responds, verse 10. He says, if you knew... If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who have given us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and the livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus seems to ignore her question and her concern about the surface dealings, <laughs> the whole Samaritan Jewish tensions thing. Uh, God is colorblind. When it comes to that and salvation. And instead, he responds with a statement in order to draw her attention, to draw her focus onto more eternal matters. Ask me, ask me who I am. I mean, let's talk about, let's talk about God's love for you. Let's talk about living water. Let's talk about living water that I can give you. And John, throughout his gospel, will consistently compare the, the temporal things with this earth uh, that this earth provides and the eternal things that are from the Lord that the Lord gives. And living water was a term used to, to refer to a spring, a, a water source deep, deep down. Like, like Larry, Larry Bernard has this artesian well in his property. No, you drink it from the water here. It's from deep, deep down. It's cold, pure water that comes forth, right? That's the idea of living water is a deep, deep water source. They would use that in that time to refer to that. The water that Jesus was offering was very deep indeed. No tool could extract it. Even great people like Jacob or Abraham could not help. Because the living water that Jesus spoke of was in the very heart of God. And Jesus himself was the very cup and wellspring. But we must want it and ask for it. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, and you say, you know, I, I drank of, of what Jesus offers and I feel thirsty and empty again. Let me, let me suggest something to you. You drink again. It isn't a one-time sip of Jesus that satisfies forever. That's why I don't do a lot of altar calls, because I've seen how misleading that is. People do an altar call and emotionally raise their hand. They come down, and, and then they say, oh I, oh, I drank that cup. 
and I'm good. And then they, you, they don't walk in the Lord. They don't, they don't press into the Lord. They don't get to be a part of his family. They don't spend time with him. And they find themselves beat up, beat down, and hurt down the road going, I tried Jesus. It didn't work for me. It's not a one-time sip of Jesus. It satisfies forever. Just as a branch cannot detach itself from the tree and survive, right? Only for a little bit, and it dries up. Leaves fall off, and it dies. The continual connection with Jesus, it's imperative. And what happens is we begin to drink from his, from his well is that he becomes every bit a part, not just a part of us, but we become every bit of him. And our life is consist for, it exists for him. And he is that source that perpetually gives and brings satisfaction in life. It's powerful. So, so here, Jesus is, is drawing this desperate, thirsty woman into, into eternal things. Into eter- not, not into surface things, but into, into eternal things. And she responds, sir, give me this. She says, G- give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on the mountain. And you Jews in Jerusalem, says that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So in this, in this dialogue between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, there, there is a beautiful meeting of the minds. Her mind and the mind of God. Uh, Within her mind is a mind of guilt from sin, false perspective, and avoidance of truth. And the Lord meets her so beautifully, so gently, doesn't condemn, doesn't condone, belittle, or offend her, but meets her right where she is with the mind of God, presenting to her truth and extending truth her the courteous opportunity to receive it. This is how the Lord reasons with us. And I think we can learn a lot from from this gracious approach that Jesus takes. He calls sin what it is, okay? He doesn't like just put it up, oh, it's not, oh, that's not really sin. He doesn't doesn't change sin. He calls it what it is. Truth and love. Love. You've lived with, joined yourself to, and played the part of a wife many times outside of God's approval. That's what he's saying to her. Jesus knew what she was turning to in order to quench her thirst. The rich young ruler, he looked to his wealth. And Jesus said, leave it behind and follow me. Peter and Andrew, they looked to their work. He said, hey, leave the nets. I'll make you fisher and men. The Pharisees, man, they turned to their religion. Make them feel good robotically going through all the laws. They turn to their religion. This woman, she turned to men. It's pretty clear. It's very common. And Jesus, he puts his finger right on it. And she responds. <laughs> she responds like we so often do when we're confronted. We, we squirm a little bit, right? We squirm a little and, and, and get the subject off ourselves. Like, hey, let's talk about something else, right? Uh, we get the subject off of our, ourself onto something controversial. 
Uh, personally, when, when the Lord deals with me, I like to go to the things I'm frustrated about. Yeah, God, but I'm frustrated because of this, because of that. Oh, we like to, like to do that. But in society, when you confront people, it, typically, it'll come forth like this. It, it, usually, it'll say, yeah, but we believe in, you know, that a woman has a right for her own body. We'll talk about abortion. They'll kind of get into that. Uh, oh, we believe in alternative lifestyles and homosexuality. They kind of they kind of change the subject to, to those kind of things that kind of throw you off your game and get you into something other than than what's really really important, and that's your relationship with Jesus. Let's talk about evolution. Now, I believe that we came forth from primordial sludge, five million, five hundred million, five billion. Wait, it's got to be five hundred billion years ago, right? So whatever the, the cause may be, whatever they they may go theological with us when we when we bring them to eternal things. If God's real and so loving, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? Oh, threw me off my game, right? In that day, the place of worship was a heated debate, just like these that I mentioned today, was a heated debate uh, for, 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 uh, between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews believed, the, and, and rightfully so, according to God's word, that the temple in Jerusalem is where they should be worshiping. But the Samaritans had mixed their, their beliefs of Yahweh with other pagan beliefs. And, and so they would use Mount Gerizim as their main place of worship, well, outside of Sikar there, right? But, but even before that time, during the time when Israel was divided, the northern kingdom began to worship uh, worship there on Mount Gerizim, and they could avoid the place of worship down in Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, where there would be conviction because they were bringing in pagan beliefs as well. They can avoid that all together, and they created their own place and have their own blasphemous practices. But likewise, the woman is avoiding Jesus' probing. And I would rather argue about this, but Jesus really doesn't entertain her very much. It really doesn't matter where you worship but who and how you worship. Salvation or the Messiah, he says, will come forth from the Jews. And you want to talk about your fathers, Abram and Jacob and so on. You want to talk about, about your fathers. Let me tell you about my father. He is spirit and truth and seeks those who will worship him in spirit and truth. You know, people get so hung up. They get so hung up on the non-essentials. They major on the minors. They minor on the majors. But listen, don't play games with God. This is what Jesus is saying to her. Don't play games with God. Right? And if you're looking for the promised Messiah, he says, I who speak to you am he. And we're told right at this point while he's sharing, verse 27, at this point, the disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, hey, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, maybe kind of an awkward situation, <laughs> left her, her water pot, and she went her way to the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have ever done. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you know not. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him food to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So when the disciples uh, arrive uh, in at the well with Chick-fil-A from the nearby cigar, right? Hey, you got some Chick-fil-A? I got you waffle fry, you know, whatever. You know, they're, they're shocked. They're shocked to see this engagement between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. Hey, he didn't do anything wrong, right? This was a cultural thing. It wasn't in the law. He couldn't do, he didn't do anything wrong. 
He was out in the open. He wasn't behind closed doors or anything. He was out in the, you know, an open by a well. Didn't do anything wrong. So they really couldn't say anything, but the culture dictated that w- what was wrong and right. And Jesus continued to knock down those walls, ethnic and gender walls. And let me submit something to you. Today, today what is right and wrong is being pressed upon us by the culture around us. Please do not succumb like robots to the ethics of this culture around you and let it take you to its low place in hell. Let the Lord Jesus, let his word be your foundation and your high tower. He will elevate you beyond the culture into the heavenlies. Because it will lead you astray. This culture will say, oh, this is a man's role. This is a woman's role. The culture will say, oh, this is what defines a man. This is what defines a woman. The culture will say, this is what sexuality should be, right? But what does the word of God say in all of those? That is where we should stand. Not what the culture dictates, but the word of God. This woman was challenged. She was challenged but then elevated, convicted, but no doubt honored for probably the first time by a man in her life. And she left that pot. Those are expensive. So, you know, to leave it, it means she was coming back. (laughs) She left the pot and she ran to to witness and bring others to Jesus. And Jesus (laughs) went from sir to prophet to Christ in her eyes. Such a beautiful testimony. And Jesus uses this (laughs) I believe to teach his disciples. Hey, aren't you hungry? They ask. And Jesus says, hey, have food which you know not of. Jesus wasn't saying that that food and drink and rest are not important. But rather, he wanted his disciples to know that life was more than just bread to eat. And there's so much Fulfillment and sustenance found when our food is to do the will of him who sent us. Oh, there's satisfaction that no one, no one can even comprehend. The food was to do the will of him who sent me, Jesus said. Where I get it wrong is when others creep in other things creep into my life. They creep in, they, they crowd and choke my purpose, the cares of the world. Even parenting, providing an occupation can derail me from, from the purpose that you and I are called from, called to do. Do I give my time, talent, treasures, or resources to the Lord? Or to everything else. It doesn't matter if, if, I'm, if I'm either the sower or the reaper. The one sharing the gospel or the one coming alongside of and harvesting. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Which one of those am I? Am I doing that? Am I about the Lord's business there? That's the question that, that he's asking his disciples. That's a question that I think we have to ask ourselves as well. And I say that I am. May the Lord help you and I not just recognize, (laughs) not just recognize and do the will of him who sent us, but also finish it. Don't just have a sip of Jesus here and there, but but finish it as well. And who knows? Maybe as Jesus is sharing this about the harvest being white, that the flood of people, the crowds are, are coming up the mountain or down the mountain. Or they're coming in and they have white turbans maybe. and white. Maybe he's pointing to, to the people coming in when he's sharing this with his disciples you know, about the harvest being white. Maybe he's pointing to the Samaritans that are approaching him from town. That Jesus loved and saw huge potential with these individuals, these, these people that the others avoided and despised. Also, Jesus is dictating an urgency of the matter. Four months and then the harvest. If the harvest is not reaped, it's lost. 
those people around you and I in our lives, they're not going to be around us forever. I see that. This military town. Gosh, man, we'll learn to meet them, like them, love them, and then they leave us. That's just part of it. So, so what if I share they don't receive it? Well, that's okay. You're still a sower. Right, we're, we're, this is the one situation where we are not rewarded for our success. Right? Only our faithful diligence and our efforts toward. Because who brings the success? Jesus does. Spirit comes like the wind, Jesus said in chapter 3. We don't understand how it works always, right? That's not up to us. That's let, the, let the Lord, God of conviction, bring that love and conviction. We always don't see the effects of how the Lord uses us. So because we walk by faith and trust the Lord, and he brings us success. And Jesus says that those who, who do this will receive eternal benefits for their efforts, fruit for eternal life, he says. So, okay, last passage, we'll be quick with this. And verse 39, many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe Not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I absolutely love this passage. Many Samaritans believed in him because the word of this woman. I mean, later we're we're told that after Jesus spent two days with them, they believed because of their personal interaction. But this woman, she didn't have, like, her apologetics down, right? She didn't have, like, these, these cool, like, analogies or witnessing tools. You know, Roman roads, let me take you down it, right? She didn't have any of these tools. She simply shared the truth with those around her, and she shared it passionately. That's what she did. I'm sure she got better with it the more she did it, Right? But she simply shared the truth with passion to those around her. And she brought them to Jesus, and he then convicted, convinced, and communed with them. And then their belief came out of personally talking and seeing him, the Messiah, to know him. May we leave this place today on mission and seeing the white harvest all around us. Stand with me.